Bookaholics and welcome back to another video. Today I am bringing you a brief guide to literary terminology. This is a video that I'm going to be doing in multiple parts. I'm on the Brothers Gwyn Discord and while on there I was chatting with someone who said that he didn't feel very comfortable with his definitions of literary terms that we use when talking about books and it got me thinking that as a reviewer that is actually a shortcoming that I have that I have the presumption that people know what I'm saying when I use this terminology but for people who are more casual readers who just want to read my books that I'm reviewing because they are wondering if it will be for them or not and they have no interest in dissecting the story, I have not actually created any resources that would help someone understand what these words mean. And in the literary community a lot of creators themselves do this, they don't actually talk about the words and their meanings. And I remember when I first started watching booktube, even things like what's a TBR, what's a POV, all of these abbreviations aren't really explained. So as a tiny, teeny tiny creator, I thought the least I could do for people who are actually taking the time to watch my videos, I would make this tiny resource that would hopefully help them understand what I mean when I am making these reviews. Because yes, Google is free, but also if I just make this resource, then people can access it whenever they want to. As I said, I'm going to be breaking the videos down into multiple parts. I'm going to be focusing today specifically on narrative voices. I am going to go through some terminology and I'm going to give some examples from popular fiction. These aren't necessarily books that I love, they're just ones that actually fit this criteria and you can look at my reviews if you want to know my opinions on these books. And it's just hopefully then people will understand my reviews a bit better because it was very arrogant of me to assume that using this language without actually creating any resources, I'm just assuming that people know these terminologies and why on earth should they? So first of all, with narrative voices, the first thing I'm going to break it down into is the perspective of the story. This means it is who is telling you the story and we have three verb tenses in the English language. So we have first person, second person and third person. First person is books that speak about themselves. That means that grammatically they will be using things like I, me or we to talk about one's self within the story. Some very very popular examples of this are the uh, Fitz books within the realm of the Elsling series by Robin Hobb in which Fitz is the one telling you the story which means that it is in first person. Fitz talks about himself so he will say I did this, I went there, this happened to me. The second person perspective is actually the least common use and this is on the basis that second person is talking to you which means that it's using you as the protagonist. This is often used within literature to omit first the person that's actually speaking. So it's like you are observing someone. It's not necessarily that you are being followed, it is that we are omitting who the actual narrator is. This is a little bit more complex and a little bit more convoluted to talk about but basically it means that you have a perspective that is observing the protagonist and they are talking to the protagonist while doing so. So this one, the examples that I have, I have The Raven Tower by Anne Leckie which is set entirely in second person and it is from the perspective of someone who is observing Heir to the Throne's bodyguard. So they are saying you because they are then regaling the story back to the protagonist. Another option I have is one that doesn't use it throughout the entire narrative but intermittently throughout the story is the Broken Earth trilogy by N.K. Jemisin. This one has sections within the book that talk about you and it is to omit who is telling the story. It means that you don't know yet who is observing this protagonist but you know that they are observing the protagonist and then regaling it back to them. Third person perspective is when it is a third party. It means that it is not me, the reader, and it is not the protagonist themselves. So they are not saying I and they are not saying you, they are saying they or he or she. So this one is one that is probably the most frequently used and is divided into two separate categories. Within those categories we have omniscient and limited. An omniscient third person perspective is where you have 
a narrator who is not necessarily even part of the story, they're just a narrator, they're there to tell you the story, and an omniscient narrator will know everything. So they know the thoughts of the individual characters they are talking about, they know the feelings of the individual characters they're talking about, they know everything that's happening in the story. A limited third person narrative can refer to a protagonist or multiple protagonists, but they only know the thoughts of feelings of that protagonist. So if you have a book that has multiple perspectives, which we will get into in a bit later, you can have, for example, this, this right now, we are focusing on Tim. And so I know all the thoughts and feelings of Tim, but I don't know what everyone else around Tim is feeling. And then in the next chapter, maybe the next chapter is about Jane. And now I know all the thoughts and feelings of Jane's, but I don't know the thoughts and feelings of everyone around Jane. Which means that if you are watching Tim from Jane's perspective, you actually don't know what Tim is feeling in that chapter. Then maybe the next chapter will be from Tim's perspective and you know how Tim feels but you don't know how Jane feels. So you don't know the feelings of everyone, only the one person that you are focusing on. Some examples of third person narratives are for an omniscient one, for example you can have the likes of First Law, you have for example The Love Ship Traders by Robert Harp where you'll have multiple characters and their feelings and their thoughts on page. Simultaneously, for a limited one, you have Game of Thrones, where you are only following the thoughts and feelings of the character whose perspective you are specifically in. Or, for example, the Mistborn saga, which is exactly the same thing. You only know the feelings of the character you are in the head of in that moment. For perspectives, we have multiple perspectives or one perspective, which basically means that if you have only one perspective, you are following one protagonist throughout the entire story. They are your only character that you are following, which means that if any other narrative is happening around the protagonist and the protagonist is not part of it, you don't know what's going on. You cannot see what the protagonist doesn't see. Multiple perspective books can have a lot of protagonists, huge ensemble of characters that you are following, which means that you can get eyes and ears in different parts of the world or uh, different political situations or opposing sides of the story. And there is the term that is sometimes used as well where it is called split narrative, which is the same as multiple perspectives, but it specifically uses only two protagonists. You have only two people, so it's split down the middle, essentially. For first person perspectives, the ones that I have are Earthsea by Ursula K. Le Guin, and we also have Red Rising by Pierce Brown. They need not be first person, you can have one perspective, but it is in third person, but they are oftentimes in first person because you are following that one character. For a large ensemble of multiple characters, the examples I have gone with are Malazan or Malazan, which has a huge extensive array of characters, and the other one that I have is The Faithful and The Fallen by John Gwynn, which again has has a very extensive amount of characters. However, if you are wanting to get more than one perspective, but you don't want to have to get an almost dictionary to figure out who is who, then split narrative might be for you, in which case uh, a couple of examples I have are The Poison Wars by uh, Sam Hawke or The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. Now talking about the styles in which these books are written, the language that is used and the type of language that is used and how it is used is the type of book that we are getting into. A word that gets thrown around a lot and the very word that actually initially started this conversation for me on the Brothers Gwyn Discord was the word literary. What does literary mean? A lot of people associate it with pretentiousness, which it need not be, but it is essentially using a, a more sophisticated language. It uses very formal writing styles. It uses frequent literary devices and it is used in a way to show uh, showcase language. It is there for the purpose of the beauty of words. This can sometimes be referred to as purple prose but not all literary books are purple prose but all purple prose books are literary. So purple prose is just when it gets to the point where it's like overtly descriptive and the book's entire purpose almost is the wording. The plot comes second. The focus is the words. Literary fiction is not quite so intent on focus of the words, but it is definitely written with the aim of it being sophisticated and it using an extensive vocabulary. 
The opposite to this, of course, is non-literary stories. So you have books that are simply told to get the point across. It is using, obviously, a decently rich vocabulary that you would expect from a book, but it is not using a plethora of words. It's not using uncommon words or words that are almost defunct sometimes, which you can find in purple prose. So you have books that are still very much using a literary tone, but they need not use it in such a sophisticated manner which makes them generally a little bit more approachable. Some examples of literary books for example would be the Winter Night series by Catherine Arden starting with The Bear and the Nightingale or The Buried Giant for example by Kazuo Ishiguro. For some very well written but not necessarily literary books that we have. We have, for example, The Witch's Heart by Genevieve Gornacek, or simultaneously, you have the likes of Discworld, for example, by Terry Pratchett, which is very clear that there was craftsmanship woven into his story, but as it is satire, the tone is very, very important for that story, which means that it is not necessarily written in a way that's prosaic, it's not written in a way that is very pretty and dainty and focus on the words, but every word still clearly is crafted. So it's not necessarily that literary books are superior, it's just the way they use words is different to how you would use it in a non-literary form. So other forms of writing, some other tones that I think we discuss a lot, is you can talk about a classic tone without talking about a classic novel. Now what does that actually mean? Because classic is literally anything that people have deemed a classic. You have modern classics, you have for example Octavia Butler, you have even Tolkien is considered a classic author, but then you have Jane Austen and then you have Shakespeare. What is a classic? Classic is what you deem it is. But one thing that we do within genres, so for example, in this case, my primary reading tends to be focused on fantasy. So within fantasy, when we are talking about classic books, it harkens back to a more descriptive writing, a lot of emphasis on the surroundings, a lot of emphasis on the culture and the world building. It harkens back to Tolkien. Tolkien is who we deem the daddy of classic fantasy, which, you know, you can object to or not. I'm not going to get into that discussion. But then anything that kind of reminds you of what you think fantasy as a stereotype would be, or you can also have books that literally read like they were written a hundred years ago. An example of the uh, former for books that sound very much like what we expect from traditional fantasy is, for example, The Witcher by Andrzej Sapkowski. Now, The Witcher is an odd one to choose because it does, it is a translated work, unless you are reading it in Polish, in which case, congratulations, you have uh, aced fantasy because I bet that is so much better in Polish. But uh, it's a translated work, which means that it also will have unusual grammatical structures because it's translated. However, it harkens back descriptively and narratively to what we think classic fantasy is. And that's basically it. It's a nostalgia for times long gone. Or you can have a book that is, was written very recently, but actually feels like it was written a long time ago. A good example for this one that gets called a modern classic of fantasy a lot is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell by Susanna Clarke. This one often is referred to as a modern classic on the basis that it feels like it could have been written in the time in which it was set. To contrast the classic tone, we have the contemporary tone. Now contemporary tone basically sounds an awful lot like how we speak nowadays. That means that it is a book whose entire tone sounds like something people would be saying, like a story your friend is telling you instead of a planned out, thought out story. It has a more organic feel to it and often the language makes the story feel more relatable. Some examples that I have for contemporary are The Queen of the Tearling by Erica Johansson, which despite having this epic scope story that's set in the future but that has a uh, medieval feel to the 
to the setting, it still has a language that is incredibly approachable and ascertainable and that it does it very rarely uses words that don't feel like it would be in your usual Lexus. Well another one that I have is the Wayfarer series by Becky Chambers. This doesn't necessarily sound like something your friend would just be telling you casually but it has a writing style where you're not going to need a dictionary, you're not going to need a thesaurus, you're not going to have to google anything. It just tells you a story as is and the emphasis on the writing is more to create emotional emotional uh, connections or to make sure that you are understanding the thoughts and processes that she's putting across. So the idea is specifically to be approachable to a modern audience. Another one that we have is academia. Now, I don't mean dark academia. I will go into subgenres of fantasy in a different video if you are interested or if you want me to. Let me know in the comments down below if that's something you care about because I know that better creators have already done them. But let me know if that's one that you'd be interested in my thoughts on when it comes to subgenres. So I'm not going to be going into subgenres. So I don't mean academia in the sense of the setting or whatever. I mean academia in the sense of the writing style. So for example, these are books that sound like academic books in some way, shape or form. An example of this, for example, is Fire and Blood by George R. R. Martin. This is a, a book that details the history of the world that he created, Westeros. And this story reads like a history textbook. I listened to the audiobook of this, so I my relationship with it is a bit different to a lot of people who read it physically, but it reads like a history book. So it's like, this is something that if it, if you substituted the Targaryens with the Tudors, you'd just think, oh, this is history. It, it feels like something you'd be assigned at school. Another one that also details this and has like heritage and and has uh, family lines and geographic locations etc is The Cimmerillion by uh, J.R. Tolkien who again had a lot of emphasis on world building and therefore he created a book that literally was there to almost detail the past of his world. Another narrative style is the epistolary style. Epistolary style is a book that is written in letters or in diary entries trees or in in a written form of communication which is not something that I have read any modern takes on but the most popular ones I could think of for me personally were Frankenstein which is told mostly through letters and journal entries and Dracula which again is told in um, newspaper articles, journal entries, letters and I think we have missives in there as well, if I'm not mistaken. So these are stories that the way they tell the story is through this amalgamation of written works by sometimes multiple characters, like in Dracula, where it's through letters that are being sent from our two protagonists, from diary entries, from things that were written by the characters or it can be literally just like from the diaries and letters that have been like compiled like in Frankenstein where you're only really getting it from Victor Frankenstein's perspective and every now and then you'll just get like a correspondence to a letter that he wrote. A modern take on the epistolary which is still technically epistolary but it has evolved is mixed media. Now mixed media is still it can still be journal entries but it will include things like tape scripts or it will include podcasts or uh, emails or um, a, I don't know, a video conference. It will include multiple forms of media, comics even, like woven into the story. It will have like sketches or diagrams. And one of the prime examples for this one is the Illuminae Files, the entire three books in the Illuminae Files are written in mixed media, which means that none of it is just a block of text. It is communications through, you know, you get to read someone's diary, you get to read someone reading out what, what they see in a in a video, you get to see tape scripts, like I said, from like court cases. And it's epistolary in the sense that it is telling you it through forms of communication, but it is a more modern take on it, which will normally include technology. But it can be things like newspaper articles, magazine entries, etc. as well. Another one of those that um, is a very interesting take on this is Horror Store by Grady Hendrix, which is told as though it is an Ikea catalogue, because it is a fictional version of Ikea that gets 
haunted <laughs> and it is the uh, staff stay overnight and they are commenting what's happening and it's told through like an Ikea catalogue so it's a very very interesting take on mixed media and uh, yeah I just thought it was noteworthy of a mention. Another one that we have is the memoir style. Now memoirs are basically people telling their own stories. Normally within fantasy there are obviously fictional stories that are told as if it's someone telling their memoirs, as if someone's you know in the future telling you how they got to this point. The obvious and most popular example of this is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss which does deal with someone telling you their past. In this case you do get intermittent uh, bits of the the present where you know the story itself is interrupted to, to tell you what's happening in the present. Another one of these uh, is the Miss Percy's Guidebooks by Kwame Olsen. This one is again it's it's Miss Percy telling you her past. That's that's how memoirs work. It's just a fictional version of what you would normally assume from a memoir. A couple of additional things that are more linked to narrative than anything else I could think of. They could potentially be literary devices, but I'm going to put them in here. The first one that I have is dialect. Now, a story can be entirely written in dialect or it, conclude, it can include dialect within the dialogue. This basically means that the book is written how a person speaks, which means that it will change spelling to incorrect spelling so that you can understand specifically how this person is pronouncing the words. In the case, for example, of Chaos Walking by Patrick Ness, it has dialect throughout the entire story, which means that every time you are in Todd's perspective, Todd is illiterate and he has a very specific way of speaking. So the entirety of his perspective is told through dialect, which means that you are hearing how Todd is thinking, including his pronunciation and his poor grammar. Another type of this is for example The Mermaid of Black Conch by Monique Roffey which is a book that is told in a standard narrative format but the dialogue is in dialect which means that whenever people are you know whenever you're just reading the book as goes when you're reading descriptions or when you're reading uh, actions or non-dialogue parts to the narrative it's written in a relatively normal language however when you are reading the dialogue it is written so that you can appreciate how that person is speaking nested narrative nested narrative is where you have a story within a story this is important to narrative specifically because you can have different types of books within books a common one of these is the starless sea by erin morgenstern where you are following a character who is investigating a book and you are also getting excerpts from that book itself so you will sometimes have two different narrative styles because you'll have the style that is telling that is like the author's style telling you about this protagonist and then you will also have this fictional story within. Another common one of those is The Princess Bride by William Goldman and we also have The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Safon. All of them have very different types of stories within the story but they are generally focused around a book. You have the real world people either reading the book or focused on the book and then you have the book itself within the pages as well so they will have a different tone normally to contrast so that you can know when you're reading about the book you're reading or the book the protagonist is reading within the book. Footnotes. Now footnotes are often used within the book to add extra information. These are normally used within academic books however we in fantasy love to take on all aspects of all different types of novels, which include, in this case, footnotes. One that frequently uses footnotes, I believe, is the Nevernight series by Jay Kristoff, which basically gives you extra information of world building with footnotes. So it will mention, within the story, it will mention a creature or a place and then it will have a footnote which means that you go to the bottom of the page. So for, for example, it would say Wyvern. I don't know, I've not read the books, but it will say Wyvern and then you'll have a little number one 
next to the end of the word. And then you go to the bottom of the page and you find number one, and it will describe the wyvern according to this world. And you can read up on the information. It can be used satirically, like I believe it is in Nevenite, or it can be used authentically. And then also within footnotes, we have ones that have, a, a, it's a mixed media of footnotes. So we have the likes, for example, of the House of Leaves. Well, this is an incredibly popular book when it comes to playing with, with narrative styles. So I really wanted to mention it. And it has, for example, it's a book that people read, but then you have footnotes and annotations as though someone has read it and has annotated it. And then there is a story almost happening along the annotations, but also, so you have a book that was written, you have an academic who studied this book and has created footnotes. Then you have an, someone else who is reading the book and annotating the book. So you have so many layers going on that create a whole new additional narrative to the existing text. And apparently it makes it very convoluted to read, but quite an enjoyable experience. Again, not a book I've read, but I am very interested in reading. And the last part within this video that I'm going to talk about is tone. Now I'm not going to be talking about the content because that will come in the next video. I'm going to be talking about, again, the writing. So tone, you can have a dark tone. So for example, books that are telling you a story that is somber or that is grim or that is meant to evoke fear. So the words that are used will be to create tension or to create sadness and sorrow. You will have books that are specifically using words to make you feel a darker emotion. In contrast to that, you have a light tone, which means that you have books that have a, a happy feel to them, that the entire purpose of the story is to create an uplifting and happy environment. Even if it is actually telling quite difficult topics, the tone is what is important there. So for example, a book that tackles quite a more difficult topic than you would be led to believe by the tone would be for example the Queens of Renthia series where you do actually tackle some quite intense topics but it is done in a tone that is actually quite lyrical and quite calm or you can have it where both the tone and the story are linked for example a lot of cozy fantasy that we've been seeing lately like House in the Cerulean Sea or Legends and Lazarus with the darker tones, again, the story need not be actually as gruesome as the tone is. It's just the book is telling you that this is, you know, something that is sad or something that is somber or something that is supposed to evoke a darker emotion. Or it could be dark because it is trying to create an environment that is dark. One that I can think of that is there to make a, a world seem dark and, and grim even though the story itself need not be quite so dark, would be Angel Mage by Garth Nix, where the plot itself is not as dark as it possibly seems, but the world feels dark and the ambience and the atmosphere are dark. While ones that are directly linked to both plot and tone, I believe would be the likes of the Prince of Thorns series by Mark Lawrence. So in the next video, I am going to be talking about the plot and about subgenres and how uh, literary devices are woven into those. I'm not going to be doing a comprehensive list of subgenres, just more how they would tie into uh, plot related things. So it's going to be mostly around plot and literary devices used for the sake of plot uh, within the next video. So stay tuned for that. Let me know if there is anything else that you would like me to talk about before I get to that point. Uh, but that is everything. So thank you ever so much for watching. Thank you very much, Jake, for suggesting that I make this video. I am hoping that this is at least a good initial resource for you when both reading reviews but also when discussing books uh, hopefully it makes us seem a little bit less pretentious if I make this language a bit more accessible but yeah that is all for me for today so thank you ever so much for watching let me know in the comments as I said if there is anything else that you would like me to try and break down and explain especially with examples I do find that they are usually very helpful but yeah I'll catch you soon bye